So we are in a series about the Lord's Prayer, and we spent several months breaking down the Lord's Prayer line by line, and I hope it's changing the way you pray. If you go back and listen to the messages, I, I just believe it's that powerful. I know it's changed my prayer time with God. And here's what, here's what happened. The disciples asked Jesus, they said, teach us how to pray. And Jesus said, this is how you should pray. And he gave us an example of how to pray, and we call it the Lord's Prayer. He didn't say, memorize this prayer. He didn't say, say my prayer word for word, so you don't need to think when you pray. It's the opposite. He said, pray like this and think about what you're saying. Use it as a model of how to pray. And we're in a series called Stand Your Ground, and we're going through what Paul calls the armor of God, what it means, why you should put on your armor each day, why it's important every day. So let's stand, and we're going to say the Lord's Prayer together out loud like we have been for the last few weeks. We're going to read it together. I want you to say it like you mean it. Can you do that? Let's say it together. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Amen, you can be seated, have a seat. In the current series, we're focusing on the words, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. Protect us from the evil one. Lord, please don't allow the evil one to have his way in my life, because the evil one wants nothing more than to utterly and completely destroy you. One of the things I've realized about Christians is many times we don't realize we're in a battle because we can't see the battle. We can't see the enemy. Our enemy isn't a physical enemy, it's spiritual. But reality is we have an enemy. We have an adversary who wants the exact opposite for your life that God wants for you. So let me tell you some facts. Let me tell you the truth. Satan is real. He's not imaginary. He has thousands of demons or evil spirits who are fallen angels who were once in heaven with God helping him do his evil work. And Satan wants to defeat you. He wants to destroy you. He hates you. It's not personal. He just hates everything that God loves. He just opposes everything that God is for. So the writer Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter six to put on the full armor of God so that you can stand against the enemy's schemes. That's what the armor is for, so that we can stand, so that we don't take a beating. The armor of God is given to us so that we can have victory in the battles we face. God has provided to all of us all of the armor we need. It's up to us to choose to put it on or not. He said in this word, put on the full armor of God. That's his advice. That's in our best interest. That's for our benefit. We don't have to put on the armor, but we can. It's all available to us. If you're a Christian, if you've accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, then you have full access to everything that God's given to us. God's not holding out on us. He doesn't give some armor to some people and some armor to others. He doesn't say you get a helmet and you get a breastplate and you get shoes and you get a belt and you, you get nothing. <laughs> no, he doesn't do that. We all get all of the armor, all we need. And today we're talking about faith. Today we're talking about faith. When they first told me the message today was on faith, I was excited. I said, great, that's actually something I know about. I can do that, I can talk about that. I can talk about faith, so let me tell you about faith. Faith was born in January 1997 in Burnsville, Minnesota. She was our fourth child. And when Faith was three, she had the craziest curly hair. I mean, it was like wacky, it took a lot of... Uh, 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 Pastor Kim. Yeah, excuse me. Uh, yeah. Um, Hello? Today's about spiritual faith. Seriously? Not your youngest daughter. You're faith. real. You're not kidding. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Did we not tell you that? Uh, it would have been nice if someone told me that two weeks ago. Uh, thank you, Landon. This is embarrassing. Uh, should have clarified that, I guess. 
Um, let's go back to the Bible and see what Scripture says about spiritual faith. Sort of embarrassed that second row right here. Let's read the passage on the armor of God. Ephesians 6, verse 13 through 16. It says, Therefore, put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground. And after you have done everything, to stand. Stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist, with the breastplate of righteousness in place, with your feet fitted with the readiness that comes from the gospel of peace. In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Let me read that last sentence again. Take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Another way to say the shield of faith is the shield which is faith. The shield is faith. If that doesn't make sense yet, hang with me. I'm gonna come back to that and I think it will make sense before we're done today. But you have faith. If you're a child of God, you have all the faith you, faith you need to fight your battles in life. God has already given us what we need. Jesus said if you have faith the size of a mustard seed, you can cast a mountain into the sea. You have faith, you just need to use it when you face a battle in life. You can't fight your battles with Pastor Tim's faith, with someone else's faith. You can't fight your battles with your mama's faith or your grandpa's faith, or even your spouse's faith. My kids can't fight their battles with my faith. Now that doesn't mean we can't pray with them, or stand with them, or believe with them, or agree with them, or walk through things with them, but they need their shield and their faith for their battles. And God's given it to them, and he's given it to you. So what is faith? What does faith mean? In addition to all this, take up the shield of faith. In that sentence, think about this. Take up is a verb. It's an action on our part. It's something we do. The first three pieces of armor listed, the belt, the shoes, and the breastplate, Paul said put on. Put on means wear it, like we put on pants and we put on socks. But the shield of faith, Paul switches verbs. He changes the instructions. He doesn't say put on. He says take up. It's different instructions than the other three. The first three, belt, shoes, breastplates, are things a Roman soldier would wear all the time, every day. He would put on those things every day before he left his house. Those were something that the people Paul wrote to could easily visualize. They saw Roman soldiers in uniform on a daily basis whether they liked it or not. And the Roman soldier would wear or put on his shoes, his belt, his breastplate. Those were just part of his daily uniform. But when he became aware of an enemy, an enemy's presence, when he sensed an attack might be coming, when he sensed danger, when he noticed a threat, he takes up his shield. He's ready for an attack. He's ready for whatever the enemy throws his way. So what is faith? Faith is not just believing the truth of God but acting the truth. Listen, if you don't act in faith in the battles you face in life, then what you believe is irrelevant. Let me say that another way. If what you believe doesn't dictate the way you act or your actions, then what you believe doesn't mean much. Or you don't really believe what you think you believe. My pastor in Minnesota many years ago, we moved here 13 and a half years ago, but he used to say this all the time. People are like tea bags. You find out what's on the inside when they're in hot water. Faith is acting on the truth. And I don't mean acting like in a play or a movie. I mean our actions. I mean what we do. So if faith is acting on the truth, in order to have faith, you have to know the truth. And the truth is God's word. The truth is what God says. And what God says is in this book, the Bible. This book is God's word. Just to make it clear, let me clarify. I just wanna make sure we all understand that when I say the word, or God's word, or the word of God, what God says, or the Bible, it's all the same thing. 
The Bible is God's word. The Bible is what God says. And the Bible is, listen to me, the truth. Faith is anchored in the word of God. That's what it's all about. Faith and the word of God are inseparable. Where there is no word, there can be no faith. If faith is absent from a person's life, you'll always find the word is absent too. So you have to have the word to have faith. You can have the word and not have faith, but you can't have faith and not have the word. Because faith is believing and acting on what God says in his word. The truth is what God says. The truth is what God's word says, what the Bible says, even if it's different than what we can see or hear. I could say especially if it's different than what we could see or hear. It doesn't take faith to believe in what we can see or hear. That's why the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we live by faith, not by sight. We live by what God says over what we can see with our eyes or with our senses. So faith is acting that what God says is the truth. Faith isn't just believing what God's word says. Faith is acting that what God says is 100% true, 100% fact, 100% reality, more real than the things we can see and hear and touch. That's what faith is. Faith is looking at a situation and saying it looks like whatever, but God's word says this. So I not only believe what God says, my actions are like what God says is 100% true. My actions are like what God says is more real than what I can physically see. Let me tell you something that faith isn't. Is that okay? Faith, thank you, Tim. (laughs) Let me tell you something faith isn't. Faith is not how you feel. Faith is not a feeling or an emotion because our feelings change. How we feel is dependent on our circumstances. Feelings go up and down based on how things look, based on how things are going. When we get a good report, we say, I feel great. When we get a bad report, we don't feel so good. But our faith has nothing to do with how we feel. Our faith isn't tied to our feelings because if they were, our faith would be up and down like our feelings are, like our emotions are. So when someone is going through something, whether that's you, know somebody, or whatever, don't ask them, how do you feel? That's not important. Ask them, how is your faith? There's a big difference. I just want you to understand something. This is important. The enemy lies to us. The enemy is a liar. I just want you to understand that when you're in a battle and when you're facing a challenge in the life, don't believe the enemy's lie. Don't be deceived to believe that if you don't feel great, you don't have faith. You might feel stress or anxious or nervous. That's normal sometimes. But you can still have faith, 100% confidence that what God says is true. Faith is acting on the truth whether you feel the truth or not. And Luke chapter five is one of my favorite stories of the Bible. It's a story of Peter who was then called Simon. And he was a professional fisherman. That was his job. He had an encounter with Jesus. And this is before Peter became a disciple of Jesus. So Peter's profession was a fisherman. That's important to the story. You're with me? All right, listen to this. Peter and his crew had been fishing all night. Probably 10 to 12 hours, maybe 14 hours. It doesn't say, it just said they'd been fishing all night and they caught nothing. Nada. Zip. They were shut out. And now they were cleaning their nets. They had given up. They were going home. They were done. They were tired. They were probably disappointed and frustrated. And Jesus comes along, walking down the shore, and he says, oh, hey, guys, cast your net on the other side of the boat. Now picture this. Really try to picture this scene. Picture what Peter was probably thinking. He was probably thinking, Jesus, you're a good guy, but... You're a preacher. I'm a professional fisherman. Jesus, I've been doing this my whole life. I know fishing. If there's one thing I know, it's fishing. And now you, a preacher, are telling me where to cast my nets in the shallow water? Am I getting this right? Let me get this straight, Jesus. You're giving me fishing advice? 
And that's pretty much what Peter said in his response. This is what it says in Luke verses five through six, chapter five, verses five and six. Simon answered, Master, we've worked hard all night and haven't caught anything. But here's the key verse. Here's what Peter said next. But because you say so, I will let down the nets. Peter did it. He took action. He did something. It says, when they had done so, they caught such a large number of fish that their nets began to break. I'm sure Peter thought, this doesn't make sense to my brain. But because you say so, because of your word, I'll do it. It doesn't matter how Peter felt. It mattered what Peter did. Peter said, in other words, it doesn't matter how I feel about this. It doesn't matter what my opinion is about this. It doesn't matter what I know or all my years of experience or what my brain says. I submit all that to what you say. I will act based on what you say. What you say determines what I do and how I act. That's faith. Faith is acting on the truth, and the truth is word of God. The truth is what God says. Our role is to increase our knowledge of the truth. Our role is to increase our understanding of the truth. And then, most importantly, when that moment comes, acting on the truth. When we act on the truth or the truth determines our actions, that's how we live by faith. Romans 1, 17 says, the righteous shall live by faith. And that's what it means to take up our shield of faith. Are you with me this morning? So why is faith important? Paul told us in the same verse as take up the shield of faith so that you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. The reason you take up the shield of faith is because it can handle anything the enemy throws your way. You can't on your own, but it can. What's it? Faith. Faith is how we handle anything that life throws at you. Any battle you come against. All the flaming arrows of the evil one. You will come against some challenges in life. 1 John 5, 4 says we are overcomers by faith. And in order to be an overcomer, there have to be some challenges to overcome. And how we overcome, how we get victory is by faith. Life will give us challenges and opportunities that we need to choose to believe only what we see or hear, to believe the bad report, to fear the worst, or to stand in faith and believe what God says, to keep our eyes on him and act based on what he says, not the word, not the world. In 1996, some of you are gonna remember this story, the Olympics were in Atlanta, Georgia, and it was the last time the Summer Olympics were in the United States. So what is that, 30 years ago now? 20, 20 years ago now, thank you, 23. And uh, the USA that year had a great women's gymnastics team. They were called the Magnificent Seven. Everybody loves gymnastics at least every four years during the Olympics, right? <laughs> gymnastics, swimming, track and field. I will watch water polo if it's the Olympics. I will watch synchronized swimming if there's a medal on the line. And the women's gymnastics team that year, it was down to the last day of the team event, down to the last event, the last person to perform. Everything else was done, and the USA was in second place behind the Russian team. And the only chance for a gold for the USA team was down to the vault event. But the USA had their best vaulter up, the last person to go in the entire team event, Carrie Strug. She was the last hope and the only hope for a gold medal for the USA team. And she needed to score 9.493 or better for the team to get a gold. Carrie Strug was four foot seven inches tall. She weighed 82 pounds. And the entire country was watching her. That's a lot of pressure. In the vault event, you get two tries, two attempts. And your score is the better of the two scores. The lower score is thrown out. But on the first attempt, Carrie Strug landed short and injured her ankle. The big problem was no one could fill in for her. Even with an injury, there was no backup plan, no replacement. It was her or no one. The coach of the USA team was a man named Bella Caroli. He was originally from Romania, Romania. And he knew the only way for the team to get a gold was she had to jump again and score 9.5 or better. 
Because of the rules, he couldn't go on the mat. He could only stand on the side and yell. And he yelled at Kerry Strug with his Romanian accent, look at me, you can do it. You can do it. You can do it. Look at me. You can do it. Over and over and over, he yelled, you can do it. You can do it. Look at me. You can do it. Here's a clip of what happened next. How many times in our lives is God saying, look at me. You can do it. I know you're hurting. I know you're in pain. I know your circumstances. I know everything about you. But trust me and trust what I've said. Don't look at your problems and how big they are. Look at me. The last thing I want to share with you today about faith isn't knowing or believing or acting, but speaking faith. Speak faith and not doubt. Words of faith and words of doubt are mutually exclusive. You can't speak doubt and have faith. The words we use are important. The words we use are powerful. God created the heavens and the earth with his words. He, it says, and God said, let there be light. There's a song called, It Is Well With My Soul, and I'd like to give you a little background on that song, and then we're going to sing it together. The original song, It Is Well With My Soul, has been around a while. Some of you remember singing the hymn if you grew up in church. It was actually written in 1873 and published in 1876. It wasn't written by a songwriter, it was actually written by an attorney from Chicago named Horatio Spafford. Horatio Spafford was a successful attorney in Chicago in the 1860s. And he built a successful business and had a large number of real estate holdings in Chicago. He was married to his wife Anna and they had five children, one son and four daughters. Life was good. But in 1871, he was ruined financially by the Great Chicago Fire of 1871. And worse, much worse than losing his wealth and his business, he also lost his two-year-old son, his only son in the fire. A couple of years later in 1873, he and his wife and four daughters planned a trip to Europe where he had new business to discuss. In a late change of plans, he sent the family ahead on the SS V de Harve and he planned to join them a few days later by taking a later, trip, uh, later ship to Europe. While crossing the Atlantic Ocean, the SS V de Harve, carrying Spafford's wife and four daughters, collided with another ship. And the SS V de Harve sank rapidly. Reports say in less than 12 minutes. All four of Spafford's daughters died. His wife Anna survived and informed him of her survival and the death of his daughters by sending him a short telegram saved alone what shall i do spafford left immediately to join his wife and while on the journey across the atlantic the captain of the ship called him on deck to let him know that they were now on the exact spot that the ship carrying his wife and daughters had sank horatio spafford an attorney not a songwriter spent the rest of the voyage across the atlantic writing the words to the song it is well with my soul. The point is, Horatio Spafford didn't write a song about how he felt. He wrote a song about his faith. I know some people here today, when we sing the words, it is well, are saying, it is not well with me. It is not well in my life. I've got pain. I'm in a battle. I'm hurting. I'm worried. I'm not well. But singing it is well doesn't describe how we feel. It's a statement of our faith. It's a reminder to keep our eyes on the truth. It's a reminder to take up our shield of faith. I'm not gonna ask you right now to raise your hand if you're going through something, because I believe everyone in this room is going through something. Some more challenges, more extreme and more severe than others, but we all have our battles. So I'd like us to stand and sing this song together and say the words, listen to me, Say the words, not just saying the words that are on the screen, but saying the words as a statement of your faith. Not based on how you feel, but an action of what you believe. Let's stand and sing this song together.